It's the FNG, sir. Go easy on him, sir. It's his first day in the regiment. Right. What the hell kind of name is Soap, eh? How a Muppet like you pass selection. Flashbang through the door! Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David and as you've probably already guessed, we're going to be tearing down this set of limited edition night vision goggles. Ish. We'll get into it. Okay, these are, well, they're pretty fun, if I'm honest. These were bought as spares and repairs. I've literally no idea what's wrong with them. I didn't even have to put batteries in them. They seem to work fine for me. Anyway, that's not what we're looking at. Battery compartment at the back, 7.5 volts. I'm not really sure why it's so high. Um, maybe we'll find out. And up front, you've got some very heavily stylistically modelled plastic. And these big knobs on the sides generally don't do anything. The adjustment we've got is up here for interpupillary distance, IPD, which you may or may not remember from the VR goggles episode. Go check it out if you haven't. And this one up front, which I only just found out does the focus, which would have been really handy when I was doing filming that intro because I couldn't see much out of these properly. Otherwise, all these bits don't really do a lot. You got an on off switch here, a switch which goes between natural color and a green filter. And then you've got two different settings for the infrared. So on the front, you'll see you've got two sets of LEDs and this appears to be the ring of LEDs which is on naturally. And these LEDs come on uh, when you ask for the boost. And down there, you have a little lens for a camera. I've actually spent the time to modify a camera so it will see infrared, not one of my DSLR and mirrorless cameras, but a cheap webcam. Sorry, it's a bit blurry. It's kind of the consequences of me messing with the optics of the camera. But if I turn this on now, you'll see on the main camera that there's very little change. You might notice a little bit of red glow here, but on an infrared camera, it's like a floodlight and that's the full beam and that's the side beam. So you get two different illumination styles. Now the weird thing with this front one, which is like a ring around the, the, the camera lens, is when you're looking at people's eyes, it actually gives them like rings which float over their eyelids. It's very, very trippy. I mean, I don't think there's anything else going on here. It's just a battery box, nothing to see there. There's not gonna be anything. I mean, look at that cable that comes around. There's just gonna be nothing. On the bottom side, we do have a nice series of screws. So I'm going to make my own mistake here and I'm going to make a prediction of what we have inside. Well, sort of. Okay, so we have a CCD camera at the front and I don't think it's going to be all that remarkable. Uh, I imagine it's going to be very similar to a webcam. Now it will be modified so it can see IR light and that's probably going to be, like I say, largely based on a USB camera type. And then the back is going to be just a normal low resolution screen, nothing too exciting. What does interest me is whether they've actually gone for a custom PCB that's driving the display and managing the camera or whether actually the, the camera module is recognizably like a USB webcam that's just been stripped of its case and has some kind of high level interface to that board, whether that's USB or maybe even composite. Uh, it feels less likely, but not impossible. So, okay, so you can see that interpupillary distance adjustment, although it's very stuck. Goodness me, these are a high quality piece of kit, aren't they? I mean, they're a memorabilia toy associated with a computer game release. I was never expecting them to be really expensive or anything. In the bottom half, it's a very close coupled assembly. Everything's much closer together than I thought it was going to be. So we've definitely got a screen here. Oh nice, it's actually going to slide out as a module too. Just got one clip down here, 
holding that cable in. Front ring of LEDs. It's the second LED array. So let's get rid of plastic, plastic, plastic. And we have a screen with a bit of dirt on it. Brilliant. Camera. Ooh, daughter board glop top. Ah, of course that's where the switches are. So your five cores running between the switchboard and the main board are going to be power ground, common ground, and then two switch lines. Makes enough sense. And then this LED set, or well, both the LED sets are actually switched directly from it. So actually common ground and two positions off of one switch. So that's a one-way two position switch for the overlay, the green filter or true colour. And then you've got a actually able to focus lens on the camera. What happens if we screw that right out? It will just come out and reveal the CCD. Nice little lens stack in there. So there's that daughter board with a glob top on it. So that application integrated circuit, ASIC or glop top, um, was clearly something they brought in and I wonder if that's associated with image processing, could be display driving or it could be both on a single chip. And they've really glued the life out of that connector. I may even try and avoid taking that off. Oh interesting, there's like a rubber inlay around the whole screen. I guess that's for light dampening or deadening or, or sort of keep the light on the backlight from the screen in the container. Yeah I think that rubber shroud is to help light, help prevent light leakage, which is for an overpriced toy, a bit over the top, but a nice touch all the same. There we go, you can see a part number on that screen. I mean, it, it's just an LCD, possibly the only thing that differentiates it from some of the other LCDs we've seen in like the camcorder is possibly the fact that this will have been LED backlit rather than CFL, because uh, the these days, the control circuitry for that is more cost prohibitive than just having the LEDs. So there you go, that, that little CCD sensor is the image sensor. And the fact that we don't have anything else, I've got one crystal and an IC up here, which I can just about see a part number on, and the glop top. The glop top's doing all the hard work, which is a little bit of a shame that we can't do much with it. So how does this work? And this is one of my favorite things, which I learned about years ago from trying to make a project that use optical tracking. Um, all right, CCD sensors are obviously sensitive to the visible light spectrum and the sensitivity to different frequencies actually varies. And what's really weird is that CCDs are actually very sensitive to infrared light, which we can't see with our eyes. In fact, it's more sensitive to infrared light than most of the visible spectrum. The sensitivity curve on a CCD, if that's the visible spectrum, sort of curves up like this and peaks around infrared before dissipating off. So blue's up here, red, infrared. And most of the time we filter that out. Go look up hot mirrors and cold mirrors or hot windows and cold windows because they're really cool. And what they are is just different coatings on glass, which will either reflect or allow infrared light through or reflecting or allowing visible light through or not in the opposite way. And that's what uh, the infrared filter on most lenses does. It blocks out the infrared light. So only the visible light is seen by the CCD sensor. So what I've done with this camera here is remove that layer, which is why it's horribly out of focus but it does mean it can see in the infrared spectrum. To the extent is if I turn off the visible lights and I have a little infrared floodlight, you will see in the dark and I won't be able to see a thing. So this is what you can see. This is more or less what I can see. And it's wild that I actually have a shadow in light that I can't see with the naked eye. This is just bizarre. And I've deliberately worn this shirt because this shirt has got a pattern that's printed on and the pattern obviously reflects the same amount of infrared light, but not visible light. So when you're looking in infrared, the pattern disappears. It's just bizarre behavior. 
And that's all this camera is doing, is allowing the CCD to be driven with infrared light, which the screen then displays as either filtered or natural light. And the green filter is for the game, the context, to make it look more and more kind of like the game, like real night vision. I'm saying real night vision. Whereas the natural view of it, if you're using these and there's enough daylight, it will actually be in full normal color. It's only when it gets dark enough that the infrared spectrum is the dominant spectrum that you start getting what, like this, appears to be a black and white spectrum. I think this is really cool. It's something really fun to play with, especially if you can get into applications where your infrared camera is doing things that your visible camera isn't. Well, this looks really weird. I've left the infrared spotlight on and it's done a weird oversaturating the colors to, oh, changed again. Wild. Anyway, so that's how this camera is working. It's using that infrared sensitivity to display as much information as it can, even when it's invisible to the real person. But that's not actually how real night vision goggles work. And I say real with air quotes because these technically are night vision goggles. You can see in the dark as far as the infrared light works. And that's kind of a catch because if you're imagining this in a combat, a warfare, a, a whatever scenario, um, you can have problems putting a giant infrared light on your crew. And these things were used really long time ago and there are photos of sort of tanks not long after world war ii or even sniper rifles with these huge spotlights on them and you just think that's dangerous and only if the opposition have got infrared capabilities because those are infrared lights and the crew has an infrared camera which could see for miles with this spotlight and if nobody else had an infrared camera no problem but as soon as people started seeing these, they wanted infrared cameras and got them. And that rendered that technique absolutely useless. It meant you literally had a beacon on top of you telling your enemy where you were. So fast forward to the 80s and 90s when the American military had this ethos of owning the night. And they have, I don't know whether I want to call them optical or electro-optical night vision goggles, which they take in ambient light and amplify it. Now, this is a weird concept. They like take in light like a vidicon tube, which is a very physical process, and amplify it straight onto what is like a CRT display. So you're using an, uh, a, a photo multiplier, I think is the correct term, where the light hitting a displacement grid and energizes electrons which go through the light amplifier and then more electrons hit a phosphor tube which then the soldier sees in their night vision goggles. These are very expensive. Even today they are ridiculously expensive, but they have the advantage of not lighting you up with infrared light. So as far as the enemy sees, there's nothing. It's just like seeing a person in the dark. Now that analog light amplification system used to be the best way of getting good quality images, but it obviously came with its limitations. You're hitting a phosphor screen, which is why you originally had that green glow. There's no reason this should have a green glow. It's just to sort of emulate that tradition. And I'm kind of surprised they used a green phosphor because green is very harsh on your, your natural ability to see in the dark. You know, after you turn the lights off, you can't see for a few minutes when you have been in light. Um, it's a similar kind of thing. There are certain colours that if you are, if that is the light you're exposed to, you can start to get ready for night. So when the lights do turn off, it's not so dazzling. Does that make sense? So if they'd used a blue or a red phosphor, it may have been less visible when the night vision goggles were on, but if they ever got them taken off or the batteries ran out, the soldier would already have better prepared eyes for seeing in the dark. That seems like quite a tangent, but I'm gonna leave it there. So this, this uses that sort of active amplification, and this is how a lot of CCTV cameras work. If you've got a night vision camera, 
This is probably how it works. So there is actually another place, or a couple of other places you may have seen this technique or the results of this technique used. Now, the first is in the Xbox One Kinect. Now that used stereoscopic machine vision to get its depth perception. So it had two cameras face, uh, facing forwards about this far apart on the Xbox Kinect. And one of those was a normal vision, which enabled you to use Skype and video calls and things like that. And the other one was an infrared camera. And you could actually go through the settings where it said, show me what my Kinect can see and cycle through those. And the first one was visible light. The second one was infrared light. And the third was depth mask that it had generated from those two positions. Why it needed to use an infrared the second time round? I don't know, actually. In the first Xbox, they didn't use an infrared floodlight. They used um, an infrared scattered, like a point cloud which gave it lower resolution, but it gave specific points. And I believe that's very similar to how Face ID works on the iPhone now as well. It uses a scattered set of points, which gives it a point cloud, which is a very accurate way of doing a uh, very fast 3D rendering. It's lower resolution than you would get from a full IR camera, but it works. So the other place you may have seen the results of this technique is The Irishman, the film from a few years back. They used de digital de-aging techniques, basically CG remakes of the actors to make them look younger because this film ran over 20, 30 years, something like that. And rather than have the impracticality of trying to match that from video footage and turn that into a 3D model, which then the CG artists could then make into the de-aged versions, they actually filmed everything in two cameras, infrared and optical, like having a connect on the cinema cameras. And then they could use that to build a CG model of the actors acting at full resolution, which meant that the CG artists and animators could use that as a basis for their own models. It's a very cool technique and it means there's less invasive hardware required on set to make that work. I'm going on so many tangents here. This is just really exciting. I think this is super cool stuff. Interestingly enough, that 7.5 volts does appear to just go straight through this switchboard, both out to the LEDs. So the LEDs arrays have both got resistors built into them. So it doesn't matter too much what they would be. But that must mean either the screen or the camera module actually wanted that 7.5 volts, which is un it strikes me as strange. But without knowing what this glop top ASIC is, we'll have to assume there's a good reason for it. This may seem like a very simple hack of existing hardware to make something seemingly really out of its original purpose, but I think this technique is super, super cool. And I've, obviously there are lots of uses for it. Um, it's a shame there's not more exciting stuff to look at here. But if anybody knows where I can get a hold of the proper light amplification night vision goggles, let me know. I appreciate they should have been returned to the military service or are probably very expensive. If for whatever reason you've ended up with a broken pair in the attic that you haven't looked at for 30 years, let me know. You can get me over at the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside and we will compare the life out of CCD active night vision goggles to passive light amplification goggles. I think it would be an awesome opportunity if anyone knows where I can get a hold of some. I actually did a video uh, while I was modifying that camera to be an infrared camera. And it, there's not too much to it, it's just me waffling for a bit uh, while I did the modification. But if you're interested to see how it was done, or you've got time you want to kill, or you really want to see me take a camera apart, like we've never done that before, head over to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. I'll make sure the video finds its way over there. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.